Um, Stephen will be talking about DEX and decentralized exchanges and the other elements that surround them. Um, so if I could hand this over to you, Stephen, take it away. Oh, thanks so much, Merlinda. And thank you everyone for being here. I'm really excited about giving this presentation. And actually this is a two-step um, two uh, presentation. So there will be another follow-up presentation next week that uh, goes a little bit more in depth on uh, decentralized exchanges. And that topic will be on things like yield farming um, and some of these concepts that you hear in uh, the, the new DeFi space. So for today, we're just going to go over the basics. Now, uh, before we go into decentralized exchanges, I first want to tell you about Dasset. Um, Dasset is a centralized exchange uh, located here in New Zealand. We uh, have over 80 digital assets trading on our platform. And uh, if you have any questions about Dasset or anything, put them in the comments and happy to answer them at the end. Um, so what is a decentralized exchange? Uh, really what it comes down to is an app, an application that enables you to buy or sell a digital token. And it enables you to buy or sell a digital token with another digital token. So uh, we'll go a little bit into the, what that means, but um, that application is really uh, a set of smart contracts. So they're um, soft pro, uh, software that runs on a blockchain. Now, unlike a traditional exchange like Dasset, where um, the counterparty is something that you might be used, uh, familiar with, like a, a company, a bank, um, an individual who is actually um, managing your funds and enabling the transfer of your funds from uh, one person or one entity to another, the uh, entity that is holding your um, funds in a decentralized exchange is the software itself. And so uh, there is certainly counterparty risk, but the counterparty risk is different. And um, with the elements that are in play, there are some um, good things and bad things that come out of this. And we'll go a little bit more into detail. Um, what makes a decentralized exchange? So there are many different pieces, and this is a very simplified presentation because really what I want to get into is the demo. And uh, so um, for a decentralized exchange, you have to have uh, some form of uh, blockchain protocol that's um, underpinning it. Um, now, there, there is a history behind decentralized exchanges. And I'm not going to go into it too much. Uh, initially, you know, there was uh, something around um, this idea of uh, order books. So if you understand how a centralized exchange works, um, there's an order book where uh, people are able to put uh, liquidity or um, assets into this order book. Uh, if you think about something like TradeMe, um, you know, without users putting listings on TradeMe, um, TradeMe is, is, is useless. And so an order book is, is um, you, you know, if you think about something like TradeMe is um, the um, the platform with all the listings of um, stuff that people want to sell. So um, taking that to assets, it's, it's very much the same thing where um, you need a, a, a basically a platform that has the ledger that shows who owns what and allows people to add liquidity to that ledger. Um, in, in the early days, and, and still today, there's uh, we're kind of uh, hybrid versions of order books where the order book um, would be managed by a centralized third party. Um, so software that manages ledger um, wouldn't necessarily be on-chain. And then on the flip side, you have completely on-chain order books. And, and that was um, organizations like Ether Delta or early in um, 2016. And so uh, then came a a project called Bancor, and they implemented something called an automated market maker. 
Now, um, most decentralized exchanges utilize these AMMs. And so um, an AMM is a, a collection of smart contracts that do a few different things. They hold people's um, crypto assets. It also enables the um, trade from one asset to another. And so um, when you uh, want to buy an asset with, um, uh, with another crypto asset, so for example, if you want to buy uh, Ethereum with a uh, stable coin like um, DAI or Tether, then you have to have DAI or Tether and um, you have to essentially send your dire tether to a smart contract and it will um, essentially send you the ethereum back and so uh, what that requires is liquidity so uh, that means that there needs to be users uh, and the users could be anyone it could be you it could be me could be um, you know companies. It can even be programs that are providing this liquidity to um, to the the set of smart contracts. And so, um, so you need liquidity. You need liquidity providers. Um, you need the underlying protocol, and um, then you need the smart contracts, the uh, automated market maker. And for an end user to access a Dex, you need a certain type of wallet. Uh, that can work with um, uh, smart contracts. And there, there are a couple of different um, standards, but the most popular one is uh, Web3. And uh, you can essentially download a wallet um, as an extension to your browser and uh, or download a wallet onto your phone that has what they call a, a DAP browser or a decentralized application browser. An example of that would be Trust Wallet. And uh, I'll, I'll show you some examples. But, um, and then of course you need cryptocurrency on the relevant blockchain network to convert it from one asset to another. So um, touching on, the liquidity. So uh, if you think about a centralized exchange like Dasset, um, so uh, a centralized exchange usually relies on a, a company or an individual or um, a, a, um, a, with, with a lot of assets that can, and, and there is usually some form of contract that requires um, a, a certain amount of um, assets on the platform and uh, other requirements like how much um, um, what the spread should be. So what the difference between the buy and the sell price. So if you go to um, NZX um, to buy shares at um, you know a local New Zealand company, NZX will hire or work with market makers and um, require that they provide liquidity 99.9% .9 of the time with um, certain requirements. For example, they can't have um, a price differential between the buyers and the sellers of more than a certain percentage. Um, and different uh, markets will have different requirements and different contracts. So the people providing the liquidity are usually people with 50, 100, um, or more, million dollars or more in liquidity. And that's what they do as their business. And so in the crypto industry, when you look at a centralized exchange, there are people, um, and, and you buy, say, $100 worth of Bitcoin. Um, usually you are buying it from an entity that is providing liquidity. I mean, you could be buying it from other individuals, um, retail, but um, a lot of the time it is institutions that are providing that liquidity. And um, so that's the beautiful thing about a decentralized exchange. It has um, some positives and negatives here. Um, and the positive is that anyone can provide liquidity. Um, and um, when I say everyone, there is a caveat. So um, some applications have certain requirements where you can only provide liquidity from a certain cryptocurrency address. And so um, you can restrict who can provide liquidity to your decentralized exchange if you're launching a decentralized exchange. But uh, a lot of the um, popular ones enable 
um, anyone to come along with um, to provide liquidity. So um, to provide liquidity, you need to have both assets. So if you want to provide, um, you know, if you have some Ethereum sitting in your wallet, it's not doing anything, you want to provide liquidity, then, um, you know, if you have $100 worth of Ethereum, then you need to have put $200 worth of liquidity um, into a uh, AMM or automated market maker. And so essentially what you need to do is provide um, $100 in Ethereum and $100 in um, the uh, opposite um, asset, which it could be, you know, what um, depending on the exchange could be anything that you want. So um, if, if it's something like a stable coin, then you might want to put $100 in Tether and $100 in ETH. And that enables you to provide liquidity to the liquidity pool. And um, when, once, so basically you're sending your ETH and you're sending your Tether to a smart contract to lock it up in that smart contract for other people to use. Um, and then when you are want to pull out your funds, you can um, when when you provide that um, those that crypto as liquidity, you receive a token. So if you think about um, uh, Ethereum as a, the unit of account, or ETH as the unit of account on the Ethereum network, um, and Tether as a digital token that. Um, sits on top of the Ethereum network as a standard called ERC-20. So um, when you provide ETH and Tether to a, a liquidity pool, you receive an equivalent amount of tokens back called um, liquidity pool tokens or LP tokens. And so these are um, the same standard as um, Tether. So it's an ERC-20. Uh, but the only thing, the only difference really is um, that you need to use these tokens to redeem your Ethereum and your Tether. And I'll um, go into, I'll show you a, a live demo so you understand what I'm saying here. But the interesting thing is once you have this digital token that represents your liquidity, you can trade it you can do all kinds of other things with it as well. So you can send it to somebody else and then they can redeem your Ethereum and Tether from the liquidity pool. And so, um, so, so the good thing is that it, it, it creates a little bit more access for people who want to put their crypto to work. Um, if you have crypto sitting around, you can provide liquidity and earn uh, essentially fees. So when uh, a, a common fee is uh, 10 basis points, so 0.1%. So when you buy or sell an asset on a decentralized exchange, so if you buy $100 worth of ETH with your Tether, um, you're paying 10 cents in fees. Now that, was, that 10 cents um, will be distributed to the uh, people providing liquidity. So um, you can essentially put your crypto to work and receive a little bit of tokens um, as um, uh, a fee from the uh, service of, of providing that liquidity. But, um, oops, the problem, um, and it's not necessarily a problem, but there is something to keep in mind and that's called impermanent loss. I'm not really a big fan of this term, but uh, the, the big reason why it's called impermanent loss is that it's not a loss until it's realized. And what it comes down to is if you provide liquidity for an asset, you um, may not benefit from the appreciation of an asset. And so I want to walk through this example with you. So if you are providing um, $200 in liquidity, um, for Ethereum, then you have to provide $100 um, in Ethereum and $100 in Tether. Now, you've provided $200, and let's say Ethereum is worth $100, um, you know, we could wish. And um, so you're putting one ETH 
and $100 into the liquidity pool. Now, a trader comes and buys uh, $10 worth of Ethereum from you um, or from the uh, um, liquidity pool. And so you give them um, 0 0.1 ETH and you receive $10 into the pool. So you now have $110 in Tether and um, $90 worth of ETH. So you still have $200. And actually it's um, uh, a little bit more because you receive the fee from the trade. But now the Ethereum price uh, goes up. The Ethereum price doubles. So you know Ethereum might now be worth um, $200. So you now have $180 worth of Ethereum and $110 worth of Tether. So you, your um, total value is $290 if you pull out the ETH and the Tether. The, the impermanent loss would be uh, the $10 difference if you had just kept the Ethereum and the Tether. So if you hadn't provided that liquidity, you um, would still have one ETH and $100. But now you have 0 0.9 ETH and $110. And so, um, so that $10 difference would essentially be called the impermanent loss. Now, this is extremely oversimplified because the, um, there's very complex uh, algorithms that um, factor in things like um, uh, price slippage. And then, um, so, you know, if somebody is buying a dollar worth of Ethereum versus a thousand dollars worth of Ethereum from a liquidity pool, it'll impact how much um, gets converted. And, um, you know, I'm not really talking or factoring in things like uh, arbitration. So there's um, arbitration bots that um, are on chain that are always trying to um, settle the differences between all these pools uh, on, on these different decentralized exchanges and um, the differences in price on centralized exchanges. But, um, you know, I, I think this is the best way to at least try and simplify what impermanent loss is. So um, I'll, I'll try and show you in, in my uh, demo as well. So what, what are some of the good, the bad, and the ugly? Um, with decentralized exchanges, because uh, it is definitely a mixed bag. And um, there's uh, people attempt to offset the positive or the negatives um, with uh, incentivizations, which is what I'll talk about in my next presentation. But really, um, you know, the first one is um, the learning curve. It's a little bit more challenging to um, use and, and get comfortable with the first time you use them. Um, the user experience isn't necessarily the best and uh, you know, it requires a lot more technical knowledge. You have to maintain or manage your own um, private keys. Um, you, know, you have full custody over your assets. Um, and then you have to trust the software you're working with. So does that smart contract um, really work? Uh, because if there is a flaw in that smart contract, then the custody of your assets could be at risk. And so, um, you know, the custody of your assets is held by software now that um, isn't managed by anyone. And so um, this, this software can hold, um, you know, tens and tens of billions of dollars in assets. And if that software is incorrectly um, built, then it can create um, opportunities for people to exploit them. But usually the ones that have been around for many years, um, like Bancor, um, MakerDAO, um, or MakerDAO, Uniswap, um, they've been vetted publicly, you know, hundreds and hundreds, or if not thousands of engineers have reviewed the, um, the code um, tried to um, break into it. Um, and a lot of the exploits have already happened where they've discovered the bugs and um, ironed them out. And so there's a lot more trust in, in the um, smart contracts and applications that uh, has the most liquidity. 
And in fact, some of these decentralized exchanges are doing more volume than uh, centralized exchanges. For example, Uniswap um, does more volume than Coinbase. So the other bit is liquidity. Um, you know, liquidity is finicky. And if you have anyone, so uh, the software is all open source. So you can start your own decentralized exchange tomorrow by copying and pasting the code of one that already exists. Um, the code is public and anyone um, can use it. Now, the tricky thing is you can do that, but you don't have any liquidity on your platform. So you need to attract people to put their crypto assets into your software application. And um, if you don't have enough liquidity, then people are going to essentially lose money from um, uh, price impact, uh, essentially slippage. You know, if you only have $1,000 worth of Ethereum in a um, smart contract and somebody attempts to buy um, you know, $100,000 worth of ETH from this um, uh, liquidity pool, then you're going to be spending $100,000 for um, you know, one Ethereum, something like that. And so you're going to be losing a lot of value um, from that uh, slippage, essentially. Um, one positive, this is something that um, is, is, talk, is talked about a lot. And um, there's a lot of new innovation that's happening. And uh, for example, if somebody launches an application with a digital token, then they may um, uh, list that token on a decentralized exchange first. And that um, and because uh, the requirements to get listed on a centralized exchange are quite high. You know, if you want to list on something like finance, you might need to spend millions of dollars in audits, listing fees. Um, you know, you have to know the right people. You have to spend um, 10 months going through a due diligence process. But if you want to um, get your project up and running very quickly, where people can start accessing it um, and you have something innovative, then it uh, enables people to access these digital tokens. Now, some may, um, you know, uh, uh, this also comes with higher risk. So higher risk, higher reward. Um, so you can potentially access tokens that aren't on centralized exchanges, but on the flip side, um, you, you know, these may not be as vetted. They may not be as audited. Um, they might be innovative or they might not be. And so uh, this is where it requires you to do your own due diligence. And that may require uh, some technical expertise to review the smart contracts of the application. So, so there are some benefits there where you could potentially have access to innovation, but um, you know that uh, comes at a risk where that innovation may not actually be there. Um, so here's something interesting. You know, there's in in the legacy financial world, there are a lot of complaints about moral hazard where uh, the exchanges um, like the New York Stock Exchange um, has access to um, the servers and all the trades. And so this enables them to see what people are trading and potentially put trades in front of those people or queue trades in different orders to give um, their cust uh, um, VIP customers certain privileges that uh, most other customers don't have. And so, um, so that is something called front running. And so um, it's, it's very closed, it's very, um, you know, uh, and, and it uh, creates a lot of speculation and um, uh, a lot of people uh, will talk about this as a problem in the legacy financial world. Now, the interesting thing about decentralized exchange is that 100%, well, in, in the instances that I'm referring to with um, the, the decentralized exchanges, I'm going to show you can the modern ones that have on-chain order books that are using automated market makers, all the transactions are on-chain, all the orders happen on-chain. So when you send um, uh, Ethereum to a decentralized exchange to um, sell it for Tether, 
everyone can see that transaction. They can see you sending that transaction to the Ethereum network. And so that enables anyone who has technical expertise, anyone who can create um, a, a bot or an application um, on the network to put in an order right before yours. And so it enables, so it creates a lot of transparency and, and um, publicity, but, um, and it uh, still enables things like front running, but anyone can do it and anyone can see it. And so, you know, anyone can see your wallet, they can see your trade history, they can see your trade activity, they can see how much crypto is in your account, what you're doing with your account, how you're trading it, where you're providing liquidity. So um, there's a lot of transparency there. Um, and so uh, it enables, I think, a little bit more of a fair opportunity for people who, for anyone to participate in um, things like front running. But at the same time, it, it still happens. And it's, uh, I think it's difficult to prevent when there's so much transparency. On the flip side, um, at the moment, the, there's no uh, KYC or AML requirements to access decentralized exchanges. I, don't, I think maybe some that are hybrid will in the future. But for the most part, it will really be the gatekeepers like Dasset that will have to do the KYC. Um, in terms of fees, so um, there might be on-chain fees. So if, if you were watching Ethereum over the last six months, the, the fees on Ethereum uh, became crazy. So Uniswap is a popular decentralized exchange. And um, you know, initially, anyone could buy an asset for um, you know, a few bucks, 10 bucks, 100 bucks, and the on-chain fee would be um, you know, 10 cents. Uh, and then that got to a couple dollars. And then all of a sudden it rose to $50. So if you were gonna buy you know, $100 worth of a crypto asset on Ethereum and you pay $50 in fees, then uh, it doesn't really make it worth it. And so this is moving a lot of liquidity and a lot of assets um, off of the layer one protocols to, um, or off of Ethereum as well, to competitors or to what they call layer twos or um, different protocols that are sitting on top of Ethereum. So uh, I'm going to stop with the presentation now and go into the demo. Maybe before we go into the demo, um, does anyone have a specific question uh, that we want to answer? No. Nope. And so far. All right, excellent. Again, guys, we do want to hear from you. So please feel free to drop a question in our Q&A or in the chat and we'll be able to get, and we'll make sure that Stephen gets to answer them. So this is the first most popular decentralized exchange. It's not exactly true because before this one, there was Ether Delta. But if you look at how the, um, the, the crypto industry has, has grown um, in terms of, uh, you, you know, the last Ether Delta was very popular around 2016. Um, and uh, a lot of the technology has changed, and a lot there are a lot more participants today than there were in 2016. So Uniswap is um, the most popular one, and um, so this is their interface um, for a decentralized exchange, and it's on Ethereum. And um, basically, most um, decentralized exchanges have iterated off of this platform, Uniswap. And so when you go to a decentralized exchange, almost all of them have similarities to this. And so um, I'm not going to do an exchange here um, because I just wanted to show this to you as an example um, or, or kind of the first one. But really what we have is, you know, if you have Ethereum, you can um, select a digital asset and convert um, Ethereum, or if you have the stable coin, you know, you can buy $100 worth of ETH and um, uh, uh, connect your wallet and trade here. 
Um, we're not going to do that. We're actually going to go over to Binance Smart Chain um, and make a trade here. Um, even though we're using Binance Smart Chain, this is just an example. Um, you know, we do not endorse um, any one digital asset or protocol. And uh, so this is really just for demonstration purposes. And so um, we have PancakeSwap here. PancakeSwap, as you can see, very similar to um, Uniswap. Um, the only thing is it uses a different protocol called Binance Smart Chain. It's a little bit more centralized, has lower fees. The transactions are a little bit faster, um, but it, it does have that uh, centralized nature. And so um, can everyone see my wallet when I, when I click this wallet? Just want to make sure that the um, screen shares work. Um, yep, we can see okay, your cool. MetaMask. Cool. So uh, MetaMask, that is a key ingredient. Um, if we go back to, you know, what are the elements that enable you to interact with the decentralized exchange? You need a Web3 wallet. Um, now this is uh, a wallet that's already installed on my um, browser, um, which I usually use something like Chrome. And um, usually I highly recommend using a hardware wallet um, along with your um, your, your software wallet. So I'm actually using a Trezor wallet um, along with uh, MetaMask. And we have this decentralized exchange. And as you can see, I already have some assets in here. Um, I have this digital token BNB, which is usually the fee for, um, for um, uh, executing a transaction, kind of like Ethereum is the fee used for sending a transaction on the Ethereum network. Um, so to get Ethereum or, or um, crypto into my wallet, you have to use a centralized exchange like Dasset. Um, and I've already done that uh, demo in the past. Uh, once you, um, I, I've done a demo of setting up a software wallet and also a demo of, of transferring assets from your Dasset account to um, your software wallet. So I'm not gonna do that. Let's just assume I've already done that. And I have some assets in here, but not much. Um, I actually have a, um, another digital token called Rune. This is a project that I advise for, and they're not really on any centralized exchanges, but um, what we're going to do is uh, make a swap for an asset. So we're gonna maybe convert Rune to BUSD. Now BUSD is a token that represents one US dollar. And so it's a stable coin. It's a digital token that resides on the Binance Smart Chain and has that equal, um, uh, it has in, in general um, is equal to one US dollar. So um, Rune's gone up by quite a bit. So I'm going to sell a little bit. And basically what I'm doing is I'm interacting with a, um, uh, with a smart contract. So let's see here, we're gonna to go to Rune. Um, so this um, it, uh, Binance Smart Chain is a, uh, or um, this um, BSC scan is kind of like a Google of the network. So this enables me to um, look at tr all the transactions that are happening on Binance Smart Chain. So it collects information and data that relates to Binance Smart Chain and uh, pretty much every 